Okay, so let's talk about how we monitor activity in the brain. Okay, so first off, let's just sort of talk about what's the point of monitoring activity in the brain. Um, if we want to try and figure out what part of your brain does what, we need to sort of be able to look inside your brain while you're doing things. Um, on the far left, we have the EEG, uh, electroencephalogram. And it is uh, a series of electrodes that are literally glued to your scalp. And they're put in very specific spots where we know that there are certain nuclear or nucleus clusters of neurons. And we either ask you to do something like try and memorize a list of words, or um, maybe we might ask you to think of a happy memory or, you know, something like that. Or maybe we're interested in whether um, there's abnormal functioning going on in your brain. So maybe we just want to monitor you while you're sitting there. Or maybe we want to see what your brain looks like while you're dreaming. So maybe we'll put these on you while you're dreaming. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why we might want to do an EEG. But what the EEG does is collects that activity of the electricity below each electrode. Um, so it kind of tells us this region of the brain was active during the task. So it's not very specific, but it gives us some insight. The PET scan, which is the next one in positron emission tomography, um, involves injecting some radioactive glucose into your blood. That sounds pretty horrible, but it's a low dose of, of radiation. And of course, PET scans are generally used because we are worried about something being wrong or we're doing it for research. Um, and the thing is, your brain operates exclusively on glucose. It can't operate on like stored fat or anything like that. It needs the, the free floating glucose that's in your blood at the moment to fuel it while it's doing tasks. And so by injecting you with a radioactive um, dose of glucose, and then we ask you to do a task while in this PET scan tube that's going to be picking up the radioactivity. So we ask you to do a task, the parts of your brain that are most active during the task will light up when the, um, in that um, tube that's looking for the radiation. And we use computers to colorize it, yada yada, you end up with a, a, a PET scan. The next one in is an MRI, and that is kind of looks like a, an x-ray, but it uses magnet, magnets instead of x-rays. And what's nice about it is it can see soft tissue in pretty good detail. So if you've ever had an MRI because of an injury to a shoulder or knee or something like that, you know what I'm talking about. Um, they, it gives you very fine resolution. Now, of course, seeing the structures are interesting. If you've had somebody who's had a stroke and now they've lost some skill or something like that, that can be really useful. But for a lot of psychological functioning, just seeing the gross morphology is not that interesting. So luckily the fMRI came along, functional MRI. So now it's kind of like a, a hybrid of the PET scan and the MRI because we can inject you with some markers, have you do a task while in the MRI tube, and then use the computer to colorize which parts of your brain were the most active during the task. And so we can actually see your brain with really great detail. The, the PET scan gives you much, um, much uh, less definition than the fMRI does. You can really see what structures were involved in the fMRI. Now, having said all of that, it doesn't matter which of these we're talking about. They're all pretty, um, mm, I want to say ham-fisted. <laughs> I don't know if everybody will know what that idiom means. Um, they're very, uh, each of these are very imprecise uh, in detecting what's going on exactly in your brain. and. I just I like to mention that to my intro students because um, a lot of times when you see that there's a PET scan involved in the in the report that you're reading or you see something that implies that this is the structure of the brain that's doing something that we know for sure it's doing, that's usually an overstatement. Um, we're not exactly sure what part of your brain does what. So we're really at the very, very beginning stages of trying to figure that stuff out. So always just be really careful. We don't know exactly what different structures do. Now, having said that, those structures that we do know. I'm going to start with the oldest part of our brain, which is the brainstem, and then kind of work our way up to the most evolved, or highest level part of our brain. When I say it's the oldest part of the brain, I mean that a couple of ways, because it's evolutionarily the oldest part of the brain because any creature that has a spinal 
column has a brainstem. So there's like a whole, you know, if you know your um, kingdom, phylum, all that sort of thing, if you know that, that, that sort of divides the more complex organisms for the, from the less. Every complex organ, organism that has a spinal cord has a brainstem. So it's oldest evolutionarily. Now if you're not a big fan of evolution, that's okay because it's the oldest part of your brain. As an individual person, this was the first thing that ever developed in you. For a period of time, you were umbilical cord and brainstem, and then everything else grew around you. So it's the oldest part of the or your brain. Okay, so what does it do? Well some pretty basic stuff. In an earlier segment I mentioned that we needed to cut our sheep's spinal cord at the bottom of the medulla. Okay, now you're about to find out what a medulla is. Cause see it at the bottom there? And it's really, I have to tell you, really hard to figure out where the medulla ends and the spinal cord begins. It looks pretty obvious in this picture, but it's very subtle and I have to confess I cut part of my medulla off by accident. It's hard to tell. Now what does the medulla do? Very basic things, heart rate and respiration. It's in charge of breathing and heartbeat. So if you have damage to your medulla, it's, if it's the part that controls heartbeat, you're going to die. That's it. If it's the part that controls breathing, if you have prompt medical attention and they can get you on a ventilator, you can survive that, but you may, if it, if it can't, you know, like sort of, maybe it was just a um, like a blow to your medulla and it was swollen and then the swelling goes away, then you might start breathing out, uh, you know, without the ventilator again. But if you're like Christopher Reeve who went over the f head of his horse and landed on the very top spinal um, vertebra and that crushed into his medulla, immediately on scene he lost heartbeat and respiration but he was ul ultimately able to get heartbeat back or he would have died. But he never got the medulla functioning in the breathing area again. And so for his entire life, he had to sleep on a ventilator. He could get off the ventilator and voluntarily breathe, where he had to put completely consciously think, breathe in, breathe out. Whereas you can breathe and not think about it. Um, he couldn't do it without thinking about it because that requires the medulla. The next level up, um, I wanted to focus on the reticular formation. The reticular formation is in charge of let me check this real quick. Okay, yeah, see, I thought I, I thought I had made zoom-ins. So medulla does heartbeat and respiration. Um, the reticular formation is in charge of arousal, how awake you are, how alert you are. Um, so when you're feeling sleepy in the evening, that's your reticular formation telling you it's time to get ready to go to bed. Um, when you feel sleepier in the winter than you do in the summer, that's your reticular formation responding to the lower light in the winter time. So it's in charge of sort of your sleep-wake circadian rhythm level of arousal. We use the word arousal not to mean sexual arousal, but to say how your body is functioning, you know, um, your heart rate, stuff like that. It's, so it controls, um, you know, like part of your sympathetic nervous system, things like that. At the very top is this ball called the thalamus, and it routes all the sensory inputs that are coming in through your eyes, your nose, your tongue, your ears, your, your skin receptors. As that stuff comes in, your thalamus assesses that information and decides where to send it. So anything that's coming in through your eyes gets sent to the back of your brain for processing. Anything for touch will go up to the sensory receptor sites and, and so on. Um, so thalamus, we like to talk about it as like your switchboard, but that's kind of antiquated terminology, right, because what's a switchboard anymore? So you maybe could think about it as a router, right, more modern reference. It's the point at which things switch between your body and your brain. Um, in this little diagram, the stuff that's left, I mean, the stuff that's colored blue is processed by the left side of the brain, which is also colored blue. Everything that's colored yellow is processed by the right side of the brain, which is also color, colored yellow. There, it's, at the, it's at the level of the thalamus where information switches and gets processed by the other side. Now not only does the thalamus control that stuff coming in and switches sides, but it turns out that as stuff's going out of your brain to control movement and stuff like that, it also switches sides. But that's not because of the thalamus, it's because of something else. Okay, we're still on the brainstem. 
but now we're going to look from a different angle. And see now, you can see the spinal cord, and then see how it starts to swell, and that becomes the medulla. Um, on, and then at the very top, you can see that pinkish ball that is the thalamus. So that's what I've been talking about. Now that orange area that's got those striations on it, that you see there's two of them. Those are the cerebellum. Um, there's two hemispheres to the cerebellum. It's referred to as the little brain because it does a lot of the same stuff as the higher order cortex does that we're going to talk about later, but in a more rudimentary form. So like it handles learning, but only really rudimentary learning. Um, it handles balance. It handles sort of things that you can do without having to think about them. So, you know, a soccer player doesn't, in fact, if he, I was going to say he doesn't have to think about what to do to kick that ball. In fact, if he were to think about it, he wouldn't be as effective as if he just lets his cerebellum take over and takes his conscious mind out of it. Let the cerebellum do its work. Um, it also is the, like I said, it handles low level learning. So I put there nonverbal learning. It's the, it handles the kind of learning that we're going to talk about in most of the chapter on learning. It also handles nonverbal memory, things that you don't necessarily know you know. Um, I don't know if uh, we call that implicit memory. That kind of memory is housed in the cerebellum. So we'll talk about those in other chapters. Now, between the very basic brainstem that we've been talking about, and I just wanted to point out, I, I hope you guys can see my mouse activities here. You see how they've cut through the cerebellum, and so now you can see not only is it striated on the outside, but it's got like these, this leafy quality to it on the inside. What that's, re what that's showing us is there's a lot of surface area for neurons to be um, stored all along all that surface area. Okay, so that's the cerebellum. Um, in this picture, the thalamus is colored yellow? Sour green? I don't know what color that is. <laughs> Acid green, I think they might call it. Um, so the thalamus is always in the middle. In this picture, it happens to be greenish yellow. Okay, ju I was just trying to get you oriented to what you've already seen. Now we're going to talk about the stuff that's more in the middle, the limbic system. Um, some people call it the border system because it's sort of between the brain stem and the cortex, so it's sort of the border. Um, others, other people call it the reptilian brain because it's present in reptiles, alligators, stuff like that. Um, what does it do? Well, it coordinates emotions, very basic emotions like fear and aggression. It handles very basic drives such as hunger and the drive to reprodu reproduce sex. And it also is really important in the formation of what we call episodic memories your memory of, you know, episodes, things that you know, things that you know you know. <laughs> so the cerebellum is in charge of things you don't necessarily know you know, and the limbic system um, has structures that help you to store the things you do know you know. <laughs> now it helps you to store it. The, me the information is not stored there permanently, but it helps you to form it for per permanent storage. Okay, so let's in fact start with that structure, the hippocampus. The hippocampus is that nice blue structure. It's um, Latin, I think, possibly Greek for seahorse um, because it's got that sort of curling tail look and, and when you dissect it, it looks a lot like a seahorse. Anyway, it is in charge of processing conscious things that you're aware of, um, memories that you like your knowledge of where you were on September 11th, 2001. That would be the kind of memory that the hippocampus processes. Um, that kind of, I know where I was, or your memory of the first time you met your best friend. Um, those are the kinds of things that the hippocampus can handle. Um, it works with your amygdala, which is the purple structure right next to it, to sort of automatically, without any effort, store memories that are really emotionally charged. And we'll talk about that more when we get to the chapter on memory. But cer certain kinds of memories, you don't even have to try, and your hippocampus and your amygdala will say, uh, I don't care what our owner thinks, we definitely need to remember this. Um, so that's the hippocampus. And uh, we're going to talk about the hippocampus when we talk about schizophrenia, because one of the things that schizophrenics have trouble with is their conscious awareness. Um, we're going to talk about hippocampus when we get to the chapter on memory.
The amygdala, which I've already mentioned, um, amygdala is, again, I think it's Latin for almond, and because it's almond shaped, especially when you dissect it, it totally looks like an almond with the same little like skin around the outside. It really does look like an almond. Um, it's lima bean sized, ironically. Um, I don't know if you know what size an, uh, a lima bean is, but it's roughly twice as big as a, a shelled almond. Maybe it's the size of a, an almond still in the shell would be a good um, consistent size comparison. But there's uh, actually amygdala and hippocampus on both sides of your brain. So you have two separate hippocampuses and two separate amygdala, one on each side. Um, they are, the amygdala is important for processing emotions, especially fear and aggression. There's a particular part of your amygdala that when it gets active, you feel scared. Another part of your amygdala that when it gets active, you feel angry and aggressive. So these are, um, these are the two emotions that we know for sure the amygdala uh, handles. And we'll talk about that more when we get to the chapter on psychological disorders and talk about post-traumatic stress disorder um, because the amygdala seems to be implicated in that. And it also seems to be implicated in all anxiety disorders. Fear, right? All right. So fear and aggression. Here we have a cat that's scared and or attacking. Not sure. Um, how about the hypothalamus? That's that green area. I've zoomed in on it because it's really kind of tucked in under there. Um, bright green. It controls motivation, like your motivation to have sex or to eat or to drink. And then it's also in charge of all of the maintenance activities like we mentioned in an earlier segment. I talked about the endocrine system being governed by the hypothalamus. It's in charge of your metabolism. So, you know, if you're burning more or fewer calories um, than usual, it's because of your, um, the activity of your hypothalamus. We're going to talk about this more when we get to um, the chapter on gender and sexuality because um, the hypothalamus governs sexuality to a really large extent. Um, back, okay, so with, sorry, I went a little out of order on my zoom-ins because I've got memory and awareness. There's a hippocampus. Okay, already talked about that. Okay, perfect. So let's go ahead and stop there and uh, possibly maybe I'll reorganize my slides in the break. But in the next segment, I will pick up and talk about the cerebral cortex and its subdivisions and what it does.